Hi everybody, I'm Laura Waters from the Mortimer Market Centre in London and I'm talking about toxicity and clinical implications of different drug classes. These are my disclosures. Now when I saw the title of this talk for 15 minutes I did panic somewhat. What do I choose? There are so many classes, there's so many toxicities we could discuss. But then I remembered it's a reverse transcript day symposium so I'll be focusing primarily on the class toxicities associated with the nucleoside and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I'll also touch on the other major drug classes in current use, protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. So starting with NRTI, and I think this class exemplifies more than any other, the evolution from ugly duckling to swan. If we look at the pre-heart NRTIs, this is the NRTIs developed before the mid 1990s. We had the evolution from zidovudine in 1987 through to didanosine and zalcitabine, stavudine, and then finally lamivudine in 1995. Now the issue with this drug class was primarily related to toxicity secondary to mitochondrial dysfunction. And this was driven by impaired mitochondrial DNA production, secondary to the inhibition of polymerase gamma by NRTIs. Polymerase gamma is the human polymerase most affected by NRTIs and mitochondrial dysfunction can result. And this is where it gets quite interesting from a pharmacological perspective, because if you look at the different chiral forms of the same drug, taking lamivudine as an example, the negative chiral form of lamivudine has much less affinity for polymerase gamma than the positive, yet the same impact on reverse transcriptase. So this is the version that was developed and is the 3TC we know and mainly love. Also, it depends on how well the NRTI is excised from that polymerase. So after binding, lamivudine is excised much more efficiently than zidovudine, for example, which once bound that polymerase, pretty much stays stuck there. So it's the affinity for polymerase and the rate of removal that are important. The other key thing are the tissues affected. So if we think back to some of those classic signature NRTI toxicities, such as lipoatrophy associated with zidovudine and stavudine, that was due to mitochondrial toxicity of fat cells. And some of those classic toxicities varied according to propensity for particular cell types. What about the post-heart NRTIs? And here we have a bacavir, tenofovir DF and emtricitabine, and then a large gap until tenofovir AF, which was licensed in 2016. These are the European licensing years. And again, from a pharmacological perspective, this is interesting. So emtricitabine is modified 3TC with the addition of a 5-fluorinated cytosine. And what that means is it has less affinity for polymerase gamma, which is already low, and slightly more reverse transcriptase affinity, which may account if we're splitting hairs for a slightly higher genetic barrier in clinical studies. Moving on from mitochondria, though, abacavir was a very interesting drug, of course, used less today. And it actually has a low propensity for mitochondrial toxicity. So here new mechanisms emerge. The classic toxicity of abacavir hypersensitivity, which is a delayed type reaction, occurs in people who carry the HLA-B5701 allele. There have been no proven, and that means patch test proven, abacavir hypersensitivity reactions in people who are negative for this allele. And this remains one of the best examples of successful use of pharmacogenetics in clinical practice. Cardiovascular disease is the other, albeit debated, toxicity associated with abacavir, although I think most agree there is a signal. And the studied mechanisms include endothelial dysfunction, and vascular inflammation. And actually structurally, Abacavir is very similar to some of the endogenous purines which are involved in signaling and can be pro-thrombotic and pro-inflammatory. The other well-studied mechanism is plate platelet aggregation and by more than one mechanism, Abacavir makes platelets more sticky. Tenofovir DF, I won't go into great detail here. I'm sure you'll be familiar with the classic toxicity profile for TDF. But renal toxicity, which can be a chronic kidney disease or a proximal tubulopathy type, the mechanism isn't entirely understood. It's possibly due to mitochondrial toxicity. And although TDF has a low affinity for polymerase gamma, the renal proximal tubule is particularly sensitive to mitochondrial toxicity. 
But we do know the renal toxicity correlates with plasma exposure because we see more with boosters, which increase plasma and intracellular tenophobia exposure. And also there are some pharmacogenomic associations. Bone mineral density loss is the other classic adverse event. The mechanism is not clear. It may be mitochondrial and may be related to low grade renal phosphate loss. I think one of the key things to point out, though, is most of the evidence for TDF and bone loss is based on DEXA. And DEXA cannot distinguish osteomalacia from osteoporosis. And that led to a conundrum for many years. You had the renal and bone concerns for TDF and the cardiovascular concerns for abacavir. But then, of course, along came tenofovir AF, the angel NRTI that would be associated with far less toxicity. And when it comes to renal and bone markers, that is indeed the case. But is TAF truly an angel? And I think there are still some issues potentially related to very high intracellular concentrations in some cell types in animal studies, including pulmonary cells. There have been case reports, albeit very few, of nephrotoxicity, because ultimately tenofovir is still the active drug. TAF has a suboptimal lipid profile compared to TDF. And in the TANGO study, which was a switch study for people suppressed on TAF-based three drug regimens, randomized to continue or to switch to dolutegravir and ibudine dual therapy, there were lipid improvements, which were most marked if they were on a boosted regimen at baseline. So removing TAF and a booster and switching to dolutegravir and ibudine improved lipids. The HOMA IR, a mechanism of insulin sensitivity, improved significantly if people on a booster and although it wasn't significant, there was still a trend if they were on an unboosted TAF-based regimen. So possible differences emerging here between a TAF FTC and a lamivudine backbone. Weight, of course, has been the big story. I won't go through all the data, but this was presented in the summer by Paddy Mallon, the US Opera cohort. And here people switching only the TDF to TAF component of their suppressive art saw a sudden upswing in their weight trajectory at the time of TAF switch. We have the advantage of pre-switch weights here and prior to switch an annualized weight gain of 0.4 kilos, which went up to 2.64 for the nine months surrounding switch and then plateaued at an annualized weight gain of 0.3 kilos per year. Now these lipid changes and weight changes uh, when switching from TDF to TAF may be associated with an increase in estimated cardiovascular risk. This was illustrated in this retrospective US cohort of 110 people. And the key message is BMI, lipids, and the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score all increased on switch from TDF to TAF. But it's important because if you use a cardiovascular risk calculator based only on lipid ratio, you may miss changes in LDL that would affect risk using other calculators like ASCVD. Now this year we actually saw some clinical endpoints. This is a ne Netherlands retrospective cohort looking at emergent cardiac events. People on TAF had significantly more new cardiac events on people on TDF or people on no tenofovir at all. The difference between TDF and no tenofovir was not statistically significant, but the difference for TAF compared to both of those groups was. Now they controlled for various factors such as gender, smoking and previous cardiac history, but they were not able to adjust for renal impairment. And clearly that's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and a driver of being on TAF. So more work is warranted, of course, but this is a signal worthy of some caution at the moment, I think. So the final question for this class, what about our next NRTI, which of course, as you know, is an NRTTI, is Latrovir. Of course, we don't know much yet. It's not been studied widely, but it's important to point out here, this study showed it has a very low propensity for interactions with polymerase gamma. So it's going to look pretty clean from that perspective. What are the clinical implications finally? Well, most old NRTI are no longer in use. Lamifudine is considered pretty inert, such that we're very happy to include it where it may offer some activity, even in the presence of resistance. B5701 testing is now standard prior to abacavir use, and abacavir is not recommended for people with high cardiovascular risk. TDF isn't recommended in people with renal or bone disease or at high risk of either of those, but I think to a degree it may be unfairly demonised, except in England where we love using TDF, because certainly if you use it in the right people with unboosted third agents, it appears to be fairly safe. TAF is considered a safe option, but the question, is it really? And I think we need to understand more about the impact of lipids 
of weight and this possible signal related to cardiac events. Moving on to NNRTI, the first generation NNRTIs were licensed in the late 1990s and nevirapine was actually a very good drug once you were stable on it. And after three months, it has a very good toxicity profile, but its use is limited by severe hypersensitivity with up to 1% of people developing a severe rash and hepatic hypersensitivity, which can be fatal. It's an immune mediated hypersensitivity related to CD4 with a higher risk at higher CD4 counts and some HLA associations, though the studies proving this tend to be small and the associations are weak. Ifavirin is also associated with rash and hepatotoxicity, though to a lesser degree than the varapine, and most people with ifavirin's rash could be treated through it. But the hallmark toxicity, of course, is neuropsychiatric. This is likely a direct neuronal toxicity effect, um, and there have been a number of mechanisms postulated, including calcium channel pathways and cannabinoid pathways. Immune-mediated hepatic injury is uncommon, but hyperlipidemia is common. It's important, however, to note that in the DAD studies, which first showed us about the abacavir and cardiovascular disease risk signal, these NNRTIs were not associated with elevated cardiovascular risk. So moving on to the second generation NNRTIs, Itraverine licensed in 2008, also associated with rash and transaminitis, though to a less severe degree, certainly than nevirapine, and a better lipid profile than efavirenz. And though there was, though there was some improvement this was still consistent with a rash and hepatitis NNRTI class toxicity. But then Rilpivirine in 2011 with much lower rates of rash, 2% compared to 13% on aflavirins in the registrational studies, less transaminitis in those same trials, relatively lipid neutral and really no signature toxicity. So this second, second generation NNRTI really shifting along and moving away from those NNRTI class effects. And then finally, of course, we have our third generation NNRTI Duravarine. Now, these are the structures. I'm no pharmacology expert, really, but you can see the structure of Duravarine is, is very different to the second generation and to Ifavirin shown here. That to me means it's likely to behave differently. And certainly if we look at rash, it's less common. And importantly, in the driver head study, the first line comparison with Ifavirin's, there were no rash related discontinuations on Duravarine compared to almost 3% in the Ifavirin's arm. Uh, liver toxicity from the liver tox database, there are no reports of clinically apparent hepatotoxicity. Transaminitis is rare, although more common, as you would expect, in hepatitis B or C co-infected patients. And finally, from a lipid regard, and here again, the head-to-head -head comparison with the Favarin's first line, you can see a really optimal lipid profile with a reduction in LDL, total cholesterol and triglycerides. So clinical implications, NNRTI class toxicities were primarily associated with the first generation and itraverine. One caveat, though, is the itraverine registrational studies were in highly treatment experienced people and often combined with many other drugs, which can, of course, cloud the interpretation. Rilpivirine and Duravarine have good safety profiles, but there is a lack of long term cohort data for our newer NNRTI, so vigilance and reporting are still key. Protease inhibitors, we have one slide, a message. The old ones were horrible, the modern ones are better, but issues include an association with chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal toxicity, and although the new ones are better than the old ones, they are still worse compared to other classes. And of course, the indirect toxicity associated with boosters and drug-drug interactions. The clinical implications are that PIs still have a role, but really they're an exception rather than first choice. And of course, we should endeavor to switch to non-boosted options where there are reasonable alternatives. Finally, integrase inhibitors. And you can see the timeline here for raltegravir through to Bictevra Bictegravir um, over an approximately 10 year period. Now, one of the initial toxicities associated primarily with raltegravir was myotoxicity, although that's thankfully uncommon. The other issue has been with CNS toxicity, and here dolutegravir has been particularly implicated, but in the cohorts that was particularly associated with abacavir use, which we'll touch on shortly. The other issue, of course, has been the pregnancy safety signal for dolutegravir, though reassuringly that is no longer a significant difference, although numerically there remains a small increased risk of neural tube defects for women who are exposed to dolutegravir at conception. And finally, the weight issue, which I shall touch on. Now, there are some very key considerations before I move on. 
The first thing is the importance of placebo and comparator. So if you look at the Stribil first line studies and the prevalence of abnormal dreams at week 48, in the Gilead 102 study compared to Efavarin's blinded study, it was 9%. In the 103 study where atazanaviratonavir was the comparator, it was 0%. So very different rates of abnormal dreams for Stribil depending on the comparator, thus illustrating the impact of placebo. There's also the importance of other drugs in the regimen. And here I use Gilead 1489 and 1490 to illustrate that point. Now in 1490, both Bictegravir and Dolutegravir are with an FTC TAF backbone. So this is a head to head of the two integrases, but in 1489, Bictegravir is with FTAF, of course, but Dolutegravir is with a Bacodin and Mivudine. And if you look at the differences in nausea rates and insomnia rates, what you're really seeing there then is an impact of a Bacodin. Yet if you look at 1489, sometimes that's interpreted as Dolutegravir being a less tolerated regimen, but I think that's clearly mainly associated with backbone. The weight signal, I won't dwell on, it's been discussed an awful lot over the last couple of years, but here, this is a pooled analysis of eight Gilead first line studies, Bictegravir and Dolutegravir associated with more weight gain than Elvitegravir, and cohorts also show Raltegravir less associated with weight gain than our second generation integrases. So in conclusion, the evolution of antiretroviral therapy has led to marked improvements in toxicity and tolerability profiles. One thing I didn't touch on, but I want to mention is incidence and point prevalence of adverse events over time should be standard. Presenting adverse events over one or two year periods without looking at how long those adverse events persist is not helpful when counselling patients. So I think we should encourage all trials to report adverse events in this way. As adverse events get less common, post-marketing surveillance, reporting events, and analyzing events in cohorts becomes all the more crucial. And as new toxicities emerge, understanding the underlying mechanisms is key so that we can then assess new drugs in the same classes for their potential risk of those same side effects. So I'd like to end by thanking you for your kind attention. There are my contact details should you wish to get in touch, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.